fresh, fresh. What up? Yo, this is crazy. <laughs> What's going on, man? Joey. How What's you up, doing? Man? I'm Yo, well, been, bro. I'm well, bro, bro. It's been a, like a hot minute <laughs> since I seen you last time. Yeah, oh, man. You you haven't aged, man. You don't age, you know? Well, you don't either. <laughs> <laughs> you, look, you look just like the same person I saw you the first time I went to Freestyle Union. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's been some there's been some little changes, but you know what I mean. But it's but uh but it's all been good, bro. Word. It's all been good. It's all been good. You know. That's yeah. great. Thank bro. you, man. Thank you for having me, man. It's a blessing. Oh man, now it's it's a blessing having you. Thank you very much for for doing this. And uh, say what's every say what's up to everybody. Hey so, hey, man. listen um. You guys give me so much life. I've been following these 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 uh convos for the last few weeks. And uh and uh and I and I there's a lot of people, my man RNL's in the house. I see a lot of there's a lot of people I've been seeing around that's been making life worth living out here. I'm feeling pretty rich these days. <laughs> nah, it's a lot of a lot of a lot of history, yo. You know that. There's a lot of MCs. Yeah. A lot of MCs at the DMV area, especially, that I feel that, like, you know, we need to expose as much so people know when they come to D.C., there's hip-hop in D.C. You know what I mean? That's... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been, man. It's been. It's been. C, what's up, C? <laughs> Word. There's been hip-hop in D.C., but, like, you know... We got to let it, let it be known, like, how, like, you know, sort of like, in, like, for example, in California, they, they had a couple, they had a couple documentaries out there showing what it was like over there. So now people, whenever they go to California, they're like, oh, okay, Freestyle Fellowship, oh, like, you know, sort of, sort of that. So, like, you know, we just... I just feel like the need to like, you know, it, and it's time, perfect timing too. You know what I mean? Like, Sure, um, sure. It's important, man. It's important. Yeah, man. So let's start this. Um, so every, uh, <laughs> every, every uh, Fresh Combo as we start off, um, where are you from? Born and raised in Washington, D.C. D.C. General Hospital, man. <laughs> D.C. General Hospital, you know, that's where it starts. My mother worked there. She wound up working there, uh, I guess, shortly after I was born there. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, D.C., any um, any particular part, or have you just moved around? Since? Well, it's it's been it's been pretty much full circle. You know, I was um, you know, we we, we lived over on Buena Vista Terrace when I was like a baby. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, moved to Baltimore for a quick little minute between like the ages of like I was five and like seven. And then I came back and okay. we moved. We came back over here to uh, Stanton Road now. And then, you know, I've lived in Southwest, the area of Southwest that people really kind of consider still Southeast. So it was on Martin Luther King Avenue. It was a little thin sliver of Southwest. Um, off of South Capitol Street. And when I got older, I moved uptown, lived up there for a while. But I've come for so I actually I live around the corner in the Vista Terrace now where I was, uh, where I was, you know, where I was so, you know, wow. full circle, life cycles. Full circle, you man. Know? That's yeah. what's up. So let's start from the beginning. Let's start like around 84 and 85. Um, 84 and 85. Well, okay. Yes. Okay. 84 well, let me 85. Ask there was a there okay. was part of DC hip hop history there. And you are a part of this. Um, so why don't you explain what was happening or what you remember during those years? 
Okay, so 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 Joey, before I do that, if you would just indulge me for about thirty seconds, there's um because I don't want to forget these names. Okay. I got a few names here, and I and I and I just really got to get these off the top. All right. Go ahead. So first of all, you know I got I definitely got to I got to give a shout to my creator. Without without the creator, we wouldn't even be talking. And to my mom, Sean James is an important name. I'll tell you about him in a second. The USMC. Uh, Tony Blackman, the Freestyle Union, Ezra Greer, Kokai, Black Indian, Steve Coleman, and my two Kung Fu uh, Sifus, uh, Grandmaster Chow Chi Liu and Grandmaster Shaoling Liu and my Wudong Longman uh, disciple family. Okay. I got to give all them. I, they, I just got to get them there off the top. So 84. 1984. Uh, so what happens is, is the guy first name on that list I mentioned, Sean, Sean James. So Sean was uh, from New York. He would he would come down to visit his family, you know, visit his aunt and stuff uh, in our neighborhood um, uh, every summer. Mm -hmm. And this particular summer, which was the summer of I want to say it was 83. He came down. He was from Flatbush and he let me hear Tila Rock. It's yours. Now, it's important, the Def Party Jam mix, for those who know, there's, 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 that record had two sides. It was the studio side, and it was this Def Party Jam mix with the crowd. Oh, oh, you know what I'm saying? When I heard, when I heard Tila Rock is yours, it just blew my whole mind over. And I knew I, wanted to, I knew I wanted to write. I knew I wanted to rhyme. So that was that summer. By that, uh, by that, by that you know, fall, close to wintertime, uh, on WDCU, UDC had a radio station, and then Frank Ski was the DJ, and he used to play hip hop on Saturdays around five thirty. And so I'm getting tapes from New York from my, you know, I call him my brother. I, I get, ta I'm getting tapes from him, right. but I'm also listening to uh, Frank Ski and Larry G show, and um. And, and and so so what I'm getting hit to is that there's actually a scene happening in D.C. area, like D.C., like Silver Springish, up into that, and you know, and so um, heard these cats on there. This cat, the Mighty Rock Box, and the USMC, and I was like, these cats nasty with it, you know. And they said that they were auditioning for a new. They wanted a new rapper in their group. So I called up the radio station and I was like, yeah, I want to be. I'm saying like my rhymes at the time, I, you know, people was telling me I was OK, but it wasn't like I was like nasty with it or nothing. Right. So I go out. So they lived out in Largo. This is 84. Now we in 84. I'm, they, they, they were out in Largo area, Addison Road area. They said, all right, well, you know. They heard me say some stuff over the phone and they were like, well, if um, come on out here, there's this kid named Jay. And you got to battle him. And if you beat him, then you in the group. So I came out there. Look, I was foaming at the mouth. I'm like, I'm about, to, I'm about, to, I'm out here. I'm about to kill it. I'm about to destroy things. I get out there. We in the parking lot of some apartment complex, right? He say his thing. I say my thing. And I guess they like me. So I was in the group. That's dope. Things kind of happened fast in 84. So, so, you know, we were going to, um, you know, like, so Frank Ski was a very important DJ at the time because he mm -hmm. had this thing called uh, this place in Silver Spring called The Crib, where it would be like break dances. You know, I'm talking about like the IBM crew, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the Pop -a -lots was, was was out there. It was a lot of like it was a lot of break dance crews. Uh, and I'm sure there was a lot of writers. Um, and then there was a lot of rappers. Um, so really kind of right off the break, I was sort of around you know, MCs that weren't really, I guess, what you would consider like go-go rappers. Oh, and God. it wasn't an easy time. Yeah, it wasn't an easy time. You know, I knew what, I liked what I liked. You know what I mean? I like what I like. So, 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 um, so, you know, people would be like, oh, you trying to be from New York, whatever, whatever. And, and you know, I mean, I kind of didn't care about it, really. I was going to keep doing what I was doing. Right. 84. So now I'm, I'm in, so I'm in, so I'm in the 11th grade. Now me and Kokai, were, we went to high school together. Okay. Actually, we went to elementary school. We, me, I've, you know, I've known Kokai. We've known each other since, like, we went, you know, fourth and fifth grade. You know what I mean? So, so then we ran back into each other in high school. When I ran into him in high school, you know, I was like, 
every day I was coming to school, I was wearing all black. You know, I had my black and white Pumas. I was like, <laughs> really, really not joking, right? And, and, and Kay, he would he would have his Kango on and stuff. He would go by the, I ain't going to tell his story. He'll tell his own story, <laughs> but, you know, he... But he was like Chili C, right? And so we weren't we weren't part of a crew together, but we would we would get together, you know what I mean? And he beatbox and stuff, and I'd be rhyming and all that, right? So there was a little community of um of of, of b boys and stuff like that in the you know mid eighties, right? And then right. The, the other spot we used to do was on Seventh Street at the Landsberg, across the street from what was DC Space, which is Seventh and E, which is the Starbucks now, but the Landsberg, um, that was Frank Ski. Basically, Frank Ski would be like, "Look, come down to the Landsberg, come over to the crib, and it'd be Caspi breakdancing, Caspi rhyme." All I wanted was a microphone. Like literally, I was just like, "Where's the mic at? I don't care about nothing, you know." But wherever the mic is, and me and USMC, we were like fifteen and sixteen. Right. USMC was nasty with it. USMC, he was from originally from LA. Okay. Right. And he 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 ended up living in D.C. Now the thing about U.S. is that he really, I kind of came to his came to that group. The group was called Dynamically Fresh, and my name was uh, T Slice. That's the name Sean from New York gave me was T Slice. T Slice. And um, yeah, and um, and so but USMC really, he was sort of like, you know, if you if you can play ball kind of good, but your man can play really good. And mm-hmm. you just hanging around them, you just get better. That's kind of how it was with U.S. I came to U.S. I was okay, but he was so nice with it. He was slick with it, and uh, and and, and it just made my game come up because I was like, you know, we dynamically we undisputed we the best. <laughs> yeah. Never smooth rappers on top of the rest on the <laughs> microphone. Calm, never nervous. It's guaranteed. We always give you complete service. You know, we used to be like, I mean, you just eighty five, but at the time we were slick with it. You know, right. Right. So, yeah, That's so good. that was really like, you know, that was really like the start of it. But, you know, that was really kind of I was I was I was uh, I was committed right from jump, you know, mm-hmm. right from jump. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's really dope, especially having someone like, you know, you have someone from New York and you got someone from from L.A., you said. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. U.S. was from L.A. He was really, man, you know, he came to D.C. I guess things was cr- – this is the early 80s. I think his mother must have brought him, you know, brought him, brought him home um, because it was uh, it was uh, crazy over there or something, you know? Right. And, the, and, like, you know, did you feel like when you met him, did, did he have a certain – different style you must say like you know how you could tell someone's from the west coast or was it sort of like you know it wasn't well i guess in the 80s it wasn't found then like you know you can't tell between a a west coast rapper or, oh no like, you, can you, you can tell you could tell you could tell okay. you could definitely tell i mean it wasn't it, it it wasn't what it would become by the you know early 90s but you could kind of tell i mean U.S. had a certain kind of swagger that just wasn't no, like, I mean, when we would go places, he'd have, like, a Kango hat, like, a, a shirt with the sleeves cut out, and, like, some crazy little, like, leather gloves or whatever, right? He looked like he was from out of Electric Boogaloo or something, <laughs> right? So he was kind of different. Oh, he was okay. kind of, you know what I mean? He definitely had his own thing, but I used to mess with him because I, I used to look at him, and I used to think, you know, this cat really just don't be caring. You know, he's going to do him, right? Plus, he can, you know, plus, plus, you know, I mean, at that time, especially, you know, he, 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 he wasn't scared. To, he wasn't scared, to, you know, if he had to knuckle up, he wasn't scared for that either. So, so that was part of it, too. Like, I was like, well, because this is D.C., you know, I know they're going to try John on you, but he used to be like, if we got direct, we got direct. You know what I mean? Right, so right. I felt like I felt like I can respect that man behind like he, he you know. He's authentic with it, you know, what he wanted. He was authentic about who he was and you know, what he wanted to. He was he was he was very he intro, he really kind of introduced me and pushed me, pushed me as a lyricist, as a young lyricist. He pushed me. He put now he got out of it. He got into uh, Jehovah's Witness. And he stopped. Rhyming. He just was like, I ain't rhyming no more. Oh, wow. So that was crazy. I mean, I, I respected that, too. But I mean, right. like. It was just kind of interesting, like, man, you know, uh, you know, because some things happened in uh, 
around about 85, we were going to record a record mm -hmm. with this. Um, so there was these Rastafarians that were over on P Potomac Avenue that uh, were like a, you know, it was like you walk in that spot. It was like he was in Kingston. They had the big reel, the reels and the big leather, like, crazy hats crazy you know what i mean it was a lot right but and they would come in and one of the dudes would come in and get on the mic and just start chatting and stuff like that so it was like and these were the people who we thought we were waiting to record with mm -hmm. but that never really happened and uh that that, that didn't really happen and, and i think right around that time is when u.s had a like kind of an epiphany or something and he got out of rhyming me i kept going over there and hanging with the rosters and what that turned into was that then I start rapping in reggae bands and I just I kind of got oh that's you know dope. like cause they because it was like I went from under one wing to under some other wings so then right, I was right, so for right. another, a few years I was like kind of just hanging with the rosters and like learning how to chat learning how to like just you know finding myself in you know just you know what I mean just like being in different different circles you know that's really dope man um, let's talk about the. Uh... Was it a BBC documentary called Welcome to yeah, the Logo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Arena. So, so Arena, there was a guest, there was a series by uh, Arena, which was, uh, a, I guess, a, a branch or an imprint or something, I guess you could say, of the BBC in London. Mm -hmm. And in 85, they were doing a um, documentary on Gogo -Go music. And at the same time they were doing that, um, there was there was also another film in DC being filmed called Good to Go. So when I was in school, I was telling people, "Yeah, I'm 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 getting ready to be in this uh, film," and they were, you know, I didn't know what it was. they thought it was Good to Go. I thought I didn't know what it was, right? And so uh, there was this cat named Shore Rap. Shore Rap was older than me in US. I'm gonna say he was about twenty. Okay. Um, and he's the one that that got to connect. And so what happened is he was like, look, I got this plug to do this BBC documentary, but I don't have no group and they want a group. So he pulled me and U.S. in. And then there was this other guy. And if, if a, I'm going to really test D.C. people, some, whoever on here, I'm going to test their hand. There was this cat named Iceberg Slim who was like 6'9". He had a song out at the time called Don't Touch That Stereo. Right? He's be like, don't touch that stereo. Don't touch that stereo. So he was in it too. So so, so like, I was trying to tell my mom I'm about to do this thing. They're gonna pay me a hundred dollars. <laughs> do this, uh, do this, do this thing for. And she was like, "You gonna do what? You ain't gonna do that, right?" And I was like, "Man, look, I snuck out the house. I was like, I ain't gonna. I am not gonna not do this, right?" They gave me my little hundred dollars. I went and got me. Look, I went and got me a pair of Lees and another pair of Pumas. You know, she was like, where you get them Pumas from? I was like, listen, that's Puma money. They give me a hundred dollars. I can get back then. I can get a pair of Pumas for like from Herman's for like thirty four dollars. But anyway, uh, so we did the so we did this. Uh, so, you know, we did this documentary, which I didn't see. Right. I never saw it. We did it in eighty five. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually see it. Until um, 2006. Damn. So almost <laughs> almost 20 years, however many years, that's like, yeah. Because they did it. Right. And then they went on, about, you know, went on back over to London or whatever. And I was working this little part-time job in Georgetown when I was in 12th grade. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one of my coworkers moved to London. My girl, Denise, she moved to London for a little while. And she came back. And she said, look, I was over in London and I saw this movie about Go-Go and guess who I saw in it, right? And I was like, that's crazy. So I didn't really, but I never saw it until um, 2006 or something like that because I was teaching at this uh, school called Rock Creek Academy. Uh, right. And I was telling one of my students the story about it. And I said, I never saw the joint. And he said, this is a little ninth grade, a little 14-year-old kid. He said, well, why don't you write them or something and see if they can send it to you. And I was like, right. So I did a little research. I wrote a letter to BBC. I explained who I was and what was and what I, what I had been doing since. Right. Right. And I kind of said that I didn't think about it. Right, man. About four weeks later, maybe even less open my mailbox. There's a DVD from BBC, man. It's got the joint. 
had they sent me, they sent, they was like, hope you enjoy it, whatever. You know, I was like, wow, you know, so I have it. I, I put it in my safety deposit box, you know. Ah, that's great. So, yeah. Actually, you can yeah. actually see see his clip on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, my kung fu sister, me, my kung fu sister, she's a film person. Like, she put it on that. I look like a baby, man. Yo, Sometimes I get, I I, yeah, like, I look, what? I look. I look like a six. I look like a six foot tall baby, man. <laughs> nah, that was that was like. It was I was dead dope, serious, though, Joe. Man. I was dead serious. Look up on them steps on that Lincoln yo. on them uh, Jefferson Memorial steps. I was dead serious about yo. that thing. <laughs> yo, when when you see this clip on YouTube, it's um under. I guess it's called "Welcome to the Go Go," right? Welcome yeah. to the Go Go. Yeah. Welcome to the Go Go, and. Um, You'll see, you'll see the clip where he's on the stairs, rhyming and stuff. That I was just like, wow, that that far, like you know what I mean? Just like, yeah, yeah. But that, that's dope. That's dope. That like, actually, it's up on YouTube now. <laughs> like, I was yeah, well, my kung fu sister like, put you know, it up there. Um, and I'm just wondering what the whole documentary is like, but um. But nah, that it was I'll dope. Send it to you. I send it to you. They have little pieces of it, right? Right. And um, you know, they did a really good job of capturing, you know, sort of what the energy was like in DC at that time with um, you know, sort of what motivated go go bands to play, like why there were so many horns, for example. Mm -hmm. in, in in go go bands, because a lot of the junior high, a lot of middle school and high school school people were learning how to play horns in middle school. Right. I mean, back in the day, uh, there was that Sousa, the school called Sousa, uh, uh, um, over there near Capitol Hill, man, they, they had, I, I remember they had like, people were playing, people were playing band instruments in middle school, you know? Sort so, of like marching bands? Yeah, marching bands and stuff yeah. like that. So they would, they would, they would do that by day and, you know, by night, you know, so now you got these go Petworth, you know, you know, um, um, Essence Prophecy, all these bands that just naturally got, you know, a trumpet player or maybe, you know, some horns in there. You know, it was, you know, that's that DC, you know, that's a special time, man. That's yeah. a special, special time. You Interesting. Know? I know they were thinking we was a Bama, you know, by, by rhyming like and not being no go-go rappers. But, but, but on the other hand, <clears throat> we was putting in our work with the pen. We was putting our work in back then. The interesting, like in DC, um, well, like yeah, from like from then till till even now, um, there's like a separation between go-go rappers and and MCs, like you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sort of, mm -hmm. sort of difference in a in a way. Like I know you experienced that because you were in you were, you're an MC in 84 and 85 and you were like well i like you know just rhyme i mean you could rhyme over basically anything but you weren't considered a go-go rapper right 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 no i wasn't i mean i, I mean, wasn't did people in... approach you like yo do you want to rhyme for this go-go band or no, 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 because I mean, really, it was almost like different worlds, you know, like different circles. I'm saying yeah. like, let's say if I fast forward up to, you know, like, like 80s, like into like the, you know, 86, 87 time frame, right? When, 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 when uh, you know, like around when Criminal Minded came out and stuff like that, you know, well, by this time, you know, you had, I think by this time, DC Scorpio had come out. Mm -hmm. You know, and and, uh, and 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 so, and at that time, and I definitely, you know, invite anybody that's on here to to to, to chime in and, and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Um, but at that time, DC Scorpio was kind of considered like you know, like the spoke. I don't know, like that dude as far as rappers from DC. Now, in, in my mind, I was like, DC Scorpio don't want no parts of me. He don't want no parts of me. <laughs> he don't. He don't. <laughs> Stay on over there and do Stone Cold Hustler, but leave me alone. You know what I mean? I'm because uh, I'm ready. Right. <laughs> I mean that was my my state at the time, you know. Um, but um, and then you know I remember you know kind of being in there was like little rap contests and stuff, you know, in like Barry Farms. I mm -hmm. showed up one time at Barry Farms. I was like 19. I showed up. 
I'm I'm figuring, you know, I'm 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 nice with it, right? But it was a different energy, you know. So I'm coming with what I'm coming with, but it was a different energy, you know. Uh, people were like, we won't hear that New York stuff. That's you know, I mean, that was the attitude at yeah. the time. Yeah. Um. I guess I don't know. I mean, I just I have the kind of mind state that just uh, I generally speaking, I don't let anything stop me from what I want to do. Right. You right. Know? So, so so you know you can you know I mean like. As an artist, you know, like just as growing up, growing up, just, you know, I've always kind of been not one to really be a get with, you know, like with what everybody mm-hmm. else is doing. You know, I just kind of just. For what? You know what I mean? For what? Right. Uh, right, um, right, so, right. So 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 it's just kind of like, um, you know, so we just kind of, you know, did, you know, personally, I just sort of did my own thing, you know, and uh, and I, I appreciate it. And now I appreciate it you know, go, go rappers. Right. right. I mean, <clears throat> I definitely appreciate it. And I appreciate it. I was, a, you know, I love go, go music, you know, and I love to, I mean, I've always just kind of loved like all kinds of music, rock and roll, go, go mm-hmm. hip hop, you know, it just happens that when it comes, when I guess, you know, what it came down to for me is um, when it comes to writing, you know, particularly when I guess when you say, when it comes to writing rhymes, right. there's just a certain way I want to, I want to project you know, my energy. Word, word. Now, um, did you participate in any battles between that time? Like, were there any, like, like battles going on or, like, you know, or, like, let's mm. say not, like, not, like, big show battles, but, like, you know, you just battle right. MCs off the street or, <laughs> mm. or whatnot, you know? Uh, not, not, it was mostly, like, rap contests. I mean, it was that kind of a setup. Like, you know, here's a rap contest, you know, come up and everybody, and then somebody judges, you know, that kind of thing. Or, you know, I, I remember uh, one time, uh, uh, yeah, like, rap contests, you know, like, little, you know, sometimes radio stations would do it. But, you know, like I was, I would, I would kind of sniff them out, sniff out little rap contests um, mm-hmm. in the early '90s, particularly because right around '92 was when I really started meeting a lot of cats that I still have a bond with now. Like I met Decompose, you know, what I mean Black Ink. You know, I met right. him back in like '92, right at like a rap joint. You know, I mean Cannabis was 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 still in town and there was stuff going on at little spots, little speakeasy type joints in Silver Spring or my man Kyle from um, you know, uh uh this this crew called One Step Beyond. There was a lot of like, you know, but it, there was, you know, in little events like this little joint infamous joint called Hoodie Wood that they had over on O Street. So there was like little showcases, that's what I want to say. Like there was a lot of little showcases that were starting to pop up in the early nineties. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was hungry, man. I was hungry and I wanted to be, you know, involved. You know, I wanted people to hear my little joints. So if there was a show, if there was a microphone around squealing somewhere, you know, and I knew about it, I was coming, you know, see right. what and meet people. Not just I mean, it wasn't I, I don't want to I don't want it to, you know, I don't want it to give the impression that I was just walking around like looking for battles. That never was. That's not really kind of like my uh, my personality. Mm-hmm. I mean, I wasn't running from that. But I'm just saying my whole thing was uh, find, you know, seek out and find who's nice. Right, right. And just, you know, like, I mean, it's like it's like it's like um, it's like running track, mm-hmm. you know, like if, if you run in with the fast runners, you're going to be faster. I never was interested in being the fastest among the slow. Right. You know, I want to find the people that's like, oh, my God, this dude is crazy with it or, or she's like stupid with the lyrics like i want to be with them this because i know that's gonna make me step up step up my, right right nah, you know, make that, me go practice yeah that totally makes sense now nah, that's really dope um that's really dope um why don't you break down all your aliases from um <laughs> <laughs> from you know yeah. from the beginning I don't have many but I got a few now, yeah cuz I know you have many so <laughs> yeah. just like Nate, break down yeah. the ones you remember <laughs> well so I like I said Deshaun James I don't know if he's on here or not that's my I love that dude um he got me he got me into uh he got me into rhyming and he gave me my first name and that was T Slice that was when I was 
uh, you know, 15 going on 16. And I held T-Slice for a while. I held T-Slice probably until um, I was like 21. Wow. Okay. There was a little period of time. Well, there was a little period of time between the time I was like uh, like 18 and 21 where um, I really, I was writing. I wasn't really performing anywhere much. I was doing stuff with the reggae bands and stuff like that. You know, I was, I was mm -hmm. calling myself T-Slice then, but I mean... <clears throat> I look at a few of those years as like, you know, I was kind of, be honest with you, man, kind of like running the streets a little bit, you know, like for a few years, I was kind of ripping and running. I didn't settle back down until I was like 21, 22. Okay. When that happened, when that happened, um, I, I changed in the, in the name I took on was Tim Buck. Tim Buck. Uh, Tim Buck T. Yeah. Tim Buck T. Tim <laughs> Buck T. <laughs> it was this guy. Yeah, yeah, because because what it was happening is I was starting to read like I had this sort of like this shift in my consciousness, so I started reading a lot okay. about uh you know African history and stuff like this. So I said, yeah, I'm gonna be Tim Buck, and uh, I had a guy who was uh you know manager who who was like, yeah, I'm gonna be your manager, you know what I mean? So so he made a whole bunch of Tim Buck T hats. I posted one of them on my on my Instagram, on my, my sub Z page. And so then, um, and, and so then, uh, right around 90, I want to say 94, mm -hmm. right around time freestyle union got formed. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, is when, uh, I switched it to, to sub Z. Um, and, uh, cause I was into the mortal Kombat thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, and since then, I just, you know, I figured, like, well, most people kind of know me as, uh, you know, so I just kind of left it, left it alone. Because really, man, you know, you can call me, you know, it don't matter if my name is, you know, Fork and Spoon, really. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, I just want, I just want to make sure that them bars is like how they're supposed to be, you know. I want right, to make sure right. I, I, I want to make sure I got good product, you know. So, um, you know, but, uh, uh <laughs> yeah, so I had a few names. I had, I had a few names. Few uh, names, no, uh, yeah. Did you have any 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 other names um, after Sub Z, or did you it, you would just remain hmm. Sub Z, right? Yeah, because even when you know when you, I formed my my band Phalo, um, right. most of the time, you know, I never really identified myself. I never had to really identify myself as you know any like as an individual in that group right. so if people you know most of the time i would just tell people you know my name terrence i wouldn't be like i'm sub z with phalo blue or something like that you know <laughs> um oh, okay i mean i roll i move in different circles you know i move in different circles right i mean right. you know i mean the only other name that i've been given is the name that my um my sifu gave me in 2005 as a disciple he gave me a name and that's the name i use on my facebook which is uh yuan chi that's my um that's my disciple name um oh, that's dope and uh yeah well so yuan the prefix yuan is spelled y-u-a-n um and that's the way lineages work is grandmaster Liu is an 18th generation wudong dragon's gate uh disciple Mm -hmm. And I'm a, I'm a disciple of him, me and my Kung Fu brothers. And so we're 19th generation. And so all our prefixes is Yuan. It's like a, it's like a, almost like a car model. You know what I mean? Like Volkswagen right. or something, right? Like his, 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 his surname, I forget what it is, but all his Kung Fu brothers and, and them have the first prefix. And then Chi is an attribute that he like he didn't give me that name right off the break. He watched me for a couple years, a few years, and then was like, you know, all right, so your attribute is chi, you know, because I was, you know, a lot of energy or whatever. My other kung fu brother, he has yuan, and then another character that means something that's an attribute of his makeup. So, so yuan chi is a is a is more of a personal kind of a, line, you know, that's that's my kung fu family name. Mm -hmm. Um. 
and stuff. But as far as rhyming and stuff like that, not nah, you know. So I, I figure, you know, at this point in the, at this point in the game, Joey, man, like I ain't got no whole bunch of name changes <laughs> left. Man. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I'm still, I'm happy. I'm still putting together, you know, bars that, you know, I, no, I'm no, kind of feeling all right no, about what dope. I'm doing that's, these days. That's really dope, man. Let's talk about Freestyle Union. Um, so how did the concept of Freestyle Union uh, come together? And uh, how did you meet uh, Tony Blackman? Mm. So uh, right around my, uh, I was going to art school. I went to Corcoran School of Art from uh, 87 to uh, 1991. Okay. And right around my senior year, I want to say, um, I would periodically run into Tony. She was going to Howard. Um, and I was hanging with some cats that was, you know, going to Howard. And then I was also doing some other little ripping and running that I don't need to get into on this joint here that would put me over there nearby Howard. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so I would run into her on the bus and stuff. And, you know, we would talk from time to time. You know, I was, I told, you know, she was in the poetry and stuff. And I would, tell, you know, I would show her like little stuff I'm writing and stuff. We would bump into each other. And then uh, around 92, uh, there was a film that this uh, poet named Kenneth Carroll uh, did called Voices Against Violence. It was Kenneth Carroll, DJ Renegade. And then this is where I met, had, this is where I met Hetty, and this is where I met Black, and this is where I met a few other, few other cats. Over on, on, off of Martin Luther King Avenue, we did this thing together, and then Tony was involved with that. So, you know, we were, we were sort of past each other and find ourselves in the same spots a few times around 90 between 92 and 94 okay but around 94 came around and um and so by this time you know around 94 came around you know we were friends by this time and uh and one one day she was just like you know kicking around tossing around this idea about you know like getting the cipher together and just you know freestyling the energy and stuff and so i mean I'm grateful to say, like, you know, I was in the room when she conceived the idea. Right. And uh, and then I started doing some little drawings and stuff, and made little flyers. And and it was very organic. You know, I, mean, I was I was on last time when, when, you know, you were when you were talking to her. And, uh, you know, it's really like how she said it, you know, like there was right. it was a very organic kind of a process. It was kind of like really a word of mouth because, you know, it's it's really pre-internet. So, you know, it was a word of mouth kind of a process. Um, you know, we inviting people who we think is nice. We meeting people. I hadn't seen Kokai since high school. Mm. Right. So, but I saw him, there was an event at the Gala theater in, um, 94, like very early. Something like that. Okay. And I ran into him and, Bill Vaughn, you know, DJ D. Salam was the DJ at that event. Uh, and there was a rap contest. <laughs> and it came down to me and Kokai, right? And I was like, Slim, I ain't seen you with each other since high school, right? And so, you know, so he, he came in first, I came in second. And um, we got back in touch with each other. And I said, you know, I told him about Freestyle Union. Right. So then he started coming. This was back when it was over on. At Eight Rock over on Eight MLK, mm -hmm. yeah, and so we just so 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 ninety four was a very important year because in a very short time, a lot of people who would end up making really big impacts on each other's lives started coming together around the same time, right? And in a short time, I mean, when you think about things that happen in the course of a year, ninety four was like an explosion. State of the Union opened up mm -hmm. uh copper house wasn't even open yet um or or, or it wasn't open in, in the sense that we know it right um so there was stuff going on there you know like we just met priest um, so, um and we just met i think we, we met storm and black and then a bunch of people start coming to eight rock for, for ciphers so 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 really man by the time summer of 94 came it was like an explosion. I mean, by some by, by late spring of ninety four, 
Um, Tony introduced me to Ezra. Okay. Ezra had a month or two prior had met Steve Coleman, who was, you know, jazz saxophonist. And in jazz music at that time, you had a few different jazz artists who were experimenting with MCs. You had Branford Marcellus. Right. You had, uh, you know, the Jazzmatazz thing. You had, um, you had a, a, a double, the cat from Double X Posse that was doing something with Greg Osby. And then Steve Coleman was doing something with, with, um, he had, a, we recorded an album called Tale of Three Cities. And so it was Kokai and myself from DC. And there was this kid named Utasi and Shalit from New York. Mm -hmm. And then there was Black Thought and Air Smooth and Andre the Great One from Philly. Wow. And so we did this recording and it was right, it was, you know, again, it's 94, summer of 94, so it's right before the Do You Want More album from The Roots. Uh, probably Steve Coleman and Metrics, A Tale of Three Fit. There's a track with me and thought on it, you know, and and, and, uh, and all of this. So anyway, all that being said is that um, things happen really fast. Things, that's right, what I, I guess right. I'm trying to say. 94 things things happen super fast. You know, within months, it, Freestyle Union was popping. Right. And we were traveling. It was crazy. It, it happened fast. It happened fast. It happened fast. But Tony um, uh, masterminded. You know, I was the other day, well, when, when, when she was on, I was saying, like, I was putting in a chat, you know, she reminded me of uh, the, the uh, Egyptian like Queen, the, the Egyptian female king, Hatshepsut. That's mm -hmm. really, that's really, she was the Hatshepsut of that. Of that right, thing. right. Um, what did you think about the MCs that were at Freestyle Union? That came to Freestyle oh, Union, sorry. That came to Freestyle Union? Well, I mean, it was, it was um, a breath of fresh air in, in one sense in terms of um, man, like everywhere you look, there's somebody that's just got their own thing, their own like mode, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and they've been clearly, you know, skilled at it, you know, so so there was that, you know, um, and the fact that we never really used the energy against each other, unless somebody was in there lunching, right, and right. we just had to check you know, I mean, it, it, and and it and there wasn't a whole lot of that, but there was a couple times, couple cats had to get checked, and um, and even with that, you know, even with that, you know, we did it with uh, you know, we did it with love, you know, you got check mm -hmm. people sometimes. Um, I know that um, I know that, and I want to just really kind of take, you know, really as specifically talk about like Casper, who who would soon become the amphibians and i'm talking about like your john moon yeah yeah uh, you know um um philly rest in power um uh uh uh, uh khalil rashad um you know uh and then the, and then you know slim cat man and hl you know with these with these beasts there was this kid named uh 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 slim cat can 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 tell him, but his name was like Le, Le Kim or something like that. I know that dude was crazy with it. Mm. Um, and and so I would usually, man, most nights, most nights we would leave the cipher. I used to be to myself, I'd be on my way home like, Shh, Jack, you got to practice, man, because this is not a game up in this thing here. Yo, you that's busy up in this thing here. <laughs> You know, no, I never felt, felt like, every time I, I don't know, I can only cipher. speak for so, myself. I can only speak, to, I, yeah, I can only speak for myself. Right. That, you know, most nights I would be like, to myself, I'd be like, Jack, you got to, you got to practice, man, because these cats got like extra brain cells or something. What's going <laughs> on? You know, and, like they got like a couple of other extra brains out here or something, you know? <laughs> But no, nah, but that was what was such, dope. You know, um, seeing people like you know, seeing other MCs from from the area, like 
like nice, you know what I mean? Just being that nice and it just inspires you to be like, okay, well, I need to come back Man. to the next cipher, like, you know, a right. little better than I let was. Let me just before. take a second to tell you about like let me just take take a second and tell you about rub. Let me just let's let me just magnify rub for for a second. This cat rub man will show up at the cipher. He's you know you know rub he's real mild man mellow kind of a cat, and he would be saying stuff like someone was whispering it in his ear, man. Mm -hmm. I used to just be like, how are you so fluid like this, right? And then you know, I look over here and you got you know you got coke, you know, and, and, and he you know coke is a whole vibe. You know what I mean? And then you got Black. I mean, B.I., you know, mm -hmm. who is very interesting. You know, I don't know if I love my little brother on here now. I love my, look, Black Indian, you know, well, me and him got a special bond. I love him. Um, but, uh, you know, I'd look at this little young cat and I'd be like, what? He, he's got something that you can't, you can't really, you can't, you can't manifest. Like, he's got something, you know, he got the je ne sais quoi. He got the thing that you know you, you can't you can't teach that. You can't teach that. You know? And all you can do you can't teach that and all you can do as an as a spectator or as a fellow member of the cipher is learn from it. You know, right. if you go in the spot, if you know, if you come in there with the attitude that you're green like you know what I mean? If you if you if you present if you if you look at yourself as a student, that's how you win. Yeah, in situations where everyone around you has so much talent. Oh, definitely. If man. you walk into that situation leading with your ego, then you're gonna get your feelings hurt. Right, right, right. Totally right about that. And you're right about Randy too, Rub. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta call him by Randy every man. time I speak to him. But like, man. yeah, um, nasty, just nasty. Like, you know. Yeah. His whole crew too, like you know, whole hibernation. Oh man! Come on, oh man. yeah, yeah. Cyrus was making beats for me. Mm -hmm. I was like, "Where's this? What plan? You know, what I'm saying, like, take me to your leader, Slim. What is this? We doing? You know? Um, yeah, man. Cyrus it's... and I worked on a project right before Illmatic came out, oh, and yeah. um, we worked on the project. We did about we did a demo. Um, and big shout to my man Timothy Jones, who uh, he he did he was you know sponsoring uh, putting together the um, hip hop uh, conferences up at Howard, and and, and he was um, had you know founded the cultural initiative. And Timothy, uh, he was really man instrumental in getting because he actually I think he introduced me to Cyrus, and so me and Cyrus started recording. And uh, the thing about Cyrus, so the reason why I mentioned that we, we did a project right before Elmatic came out, um, the way Cyrus was putting together beats okay. differently, and I could tell that I was beginning to turn the corner in terms of like my writing. Like I, I could feel like I was about to move to a, a different level of skill with writing. Mm -hmm. But Illmatic was just about to drop, and, and I was hearing stuff and seeing stuff in the source, and I was like, I can't listen to it right now, like because it, it, something tells me if I listen to it right now, when I'm just about finished the last song on this on this on this on this, on this demo, it might mess my whole you know mess my whole thing up. So I'm gonna wait until I finish writing, and then I'm gonna go ahead and enjoy Illmatic. And the Illmatic was everything that you know. I mean, that's you know what's left. You know what I'm saying? But um, but but uh. But it really, um, working with Cyrus uh, was um, an important time as well because he, I feel like, I feel like he got me in terms of what I was, you know, at, with the direction I, at least I was trying to move in anyway, you know. Nah, that's that really time. dope. Um, at that time, um, so you worked with Cyrus. Did you work with other producers as well? Um, well, around 94, you know, again, it was a real sort of an interesting, fertile period. So aside from Cyrus, um, I did, you know, me and Co Kai did a couple things together, but it wasn't, it was, it, I think we called the project it, you know what I mean? It wasn't like nobody was thinking about no opus or not even Freestyle Union Band because, you know, we had the Freestyle Union Band for a minute. Right, right. Um, 
So, so really, no, nah, really, man, be honest with you. Cyrus helped get me off them pause tapes. I was making pause tapes. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, uh, I was, uh, looping, um, I was looping, uh, uh, King Just Warriors theme for about a 20 minute loop so I could write to, you know, that's what I was doing. You know, I mean, there was so much stuff out. I would just make pause tapes from instrumentals that it was, you know, uh, 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 pause tape from that pause tape from uh, J. Ru, you know, mm -hmm. any beat that was rocking, I'd make a pause tape from it and just, you know, write. And then, and, and you know, um, I had for a minute, let me well, let me backtrack because in 90, 93 <coughs> or so, 92, 93, around 92, 93, I tried my hand at making my own beats for my, for my, you know, self. Um, and uh, and actually, and then my man DJ Rec. I can't forget Rec. Uh, uh, DJ Rec um, in ninety in ninety two, he was a, a DJ. He's a, well, he's a lot, man. He's he's he lives in uh he lives in uh Denmark now, but um, wow. he um he was uh spinning at a spot on Seventeenth uh, and Case on, on Connecticut Avenue called the Down Under Club, um, on, and and so. And he was calling himself Doogie Howes at the time. So he he was getting me hip to a lot of stuff too, right? And we would go and do stuff and he would just usually he'd be somewhere spinning and he'd be like, Come, you know, come to the down under club. I let you get on a mic, kind of thing, right? Um, and then we did a couple of things, you know, we made a little demo together. Actually we made you know, made a little demo. It's funny because this kid, you know, Mark Barnes from uh Mark Barnes, the show promoter in ninety two. I read, I made a song called Flinga Lingua. This was around the time when all the R and B singers would have rappers on that joint. Right. So That's I made it. this whole song and it was called Flinga Lingua. Can the R and B singer Flinga Lingua? You know, it was kinda corny as I look at it now. But it was my it was where I was at the time. Right. But Mark Mark says, uh Mark Bond says to me, Listen, if you change it from Flinga Lingua to Flinga Finger, <laughs> I you know, I I get behind you and back. Right. And I was like, yeah, no, nah, I don't know if I want to do that. Right. And then my man, my man, Vic say, and we in the, we, we, we down, we, we, we uptown. Look, Alamo was in the room from brand newbie and he's in the room. Mark Bond's in the room. There's a lot of these sort of good look like, you know, what I'm saying, uh, Republic Garden style cats up in there. Right. Everybody, <laughs> you know, looking real good. Got their little cowboy boots and jeans and leather bike jackets everybody you know looking good me and, and me and, and me and uh and me and Vic we in that joint we like straight you know heads you know what I mean and we looking at Alamo like man, you know why you in here with these bammers man you know so he say that and then Vic say why don't he want to call it fling a finger that's stupid and he said that man Mark Bonds flipped I was like wow really yeah so it was a kind of like I sort of saw myself at a crossroads because I could go that sort of PGC rapper kind of, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, the PGC, you know what I mean? <laughs> or I could go, and it was right before, and it was right before Freestyle Union. I was like, yeah, I don't like that. I don't like the smell of that. I don't like. I don't like that real kind of glossy. That ain't me, you know. I just right, come out right. the shelter. That ain't me. I mean, I was in the shelter for ten months. I was like, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. Well, maybe that was a that was a good decision though, because like you know. Yeah, I don't know if I answered your question though, but that's why. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was my question? Oh, um, no, you did. See? You did. You um, answered it. No. You answered it. It was um, yeah. Well, I know you spoke briefly about this, but um, let's talk about Opus Ackerman. Um. Oh, oh, how did yeah. how did how did that form like you know, mm. and uh, mm. who made up the name, mm. and um, well, how did that yeah. all begin? <laughs> Let's say that. Mm. Well, so Opus Opus um, so we got on the road with Steve Coleman. Mm -hmm. um, we were known as Steve Coleman and Metrics. Metrics was consisted of Kokai, Black Indian, and myself. Right. Whenever Steve Coleman wasn't with us, he had his core group, which was Steve Coleman and Five Elements. And you put us in there, then it's Steve Coleman and Metrics. 
So we start touring in uh, Europe in uh, 94, 95. We would, you know, mostly Europe, but then we would go to um, California, do the, um, do the uh, what they call it, the uh, Stanford Jazz Workshop and different stuff, different things. Steve told us, like, at one point, Steve told us that pretty soon the record label, which was BMG France, would probably approach us to offer us our own deal. And so around 1997, I mean, it was like he was a four. He, maybe he knew something we didn't know. And, uh, and so they approached us and was like, you know, you guys meaning, you know, like, what do y'all think about having your own thing? And we were like, you know, we were all kind of doing our own separate things, but because of Freestyle Union, we were already, you know, tight with each other, you know. Right, right. And so, um, so we, we, you know, we uh, thought about it. We put together uh, some songs. Ezra was very instrumental in this. Um, they had some. They hired some musicians as well. Um, to put together the first record, which was called Art of War. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about Art of War was that at the same time that came out, Bone Thugs came out with the Art of War. So Art of War came out, Opus, you know, and the Art of War came out with Bone Thugs at the same time. Okay. In the States, that's it, you know. Um, Opus, the name. So we were trying to, um, we, 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 uh, we were trying to, uh, we came up with the name together, Coke and I. Okay. He came up with Akabin. I came up with Opus. We had a few other different things, but that time, and then he had, he was telling me about the Adinkra symbols and stuff, the African symbols, and Akabin was a war horn, which meant to summon people to action. And I was like, well, that's dope. And, and he, and, and so, and so he came up with that part and I came up with Opus. And, uh, you know, and it was weird at first, you know, and people was kind of like, well, you know, but the logo was cool, and, and at mm -hmm. the time, you know, RBI went on the road with us our first tour. RBI right. went on the road, and um, and that was really good. I wish I knew how to see the comments that's rolling up here, but I don't want to touch nothing on his phone <laughs> and set something. Here we go. Yeah. So anyway, RBI, uh, you know, um, he um really kind of uh. Yeah, so so that's how Opus started. Now the thing right. that was interesting is that we got l let go from um, we got let go from uh, BMG France after that first album. We okay. got let go from BMG France, but one of the promoters at this club in Paris had told us he liked us, and he said, "Listen, if I, when my ship come in and I'm in a position to do something for y'all, you know, I'm gonna look you up." So we got dropped from BMG France. But the thing that happened in the in the meantime was now we got this band and we doing we performing the songs right in DC, in the New York, <coughs> you know, in Baltimore and places like this, but we're not on a label, but our show is tightening up. Mm. We're starting to get a tight unit in terms of just the sound. And then two thousand come around. Our man Pierre was true to his word. He ended up uh, being a director of a label that was just about 45 minutes north of Paris in a city called Amiens. La Belle Blue was the label. And he was like, That's, you know, how y'all feel? Y'all trying to do something? And so we recorded the next album, which I feel like, and that album was called Raw Life. I feel like that album is really the closest representation of the Opus Akabin sound because, you know, at this time, a lot of people were, you know, and naturally, I guess, you know, comparing us to the roots, mm -hmm. you know, and all this thing. And we, and, you know, and we didn't sound like we, we knew we weren't the roots. In fact, one night we opened for the roots at 930 Club. And we was like, this is the opportunity to show that we ain't the roots. Respect the roots, love the roots. We are not the roots. You right. know what I mean? And, um, and so Opus is a special, uh, yeah, that marks a very special time in my, you know, career as a as an artist musician, um, because I was able to take lessons directly 
from Steve Coleman in terms of like how you deal with a band, you know, right. how you, you know, I was around a lot of jazz cats. So it, that tweaked not just my ear. I know it tweaked all of our ears to have a certain kind of way of hearing stuff. And, um, and so, and it also, you know, sort of informed the way we were going to do music so that it wasn't necessarily like all sample driven, you know, we could fuse the sample in there, but our drummer was tight. And, you know, the drum track and the live drum, sometimes you couldn't tell what was what. Or, you know, we'd pull a sample in and have, you know, Ezra playing the line live or whatever. You know, we had a crazy key. You know, Federico Pena was playing keyboard with us for a while. Right. Jimmy Dock was playing, you know. And then Ace International, whenever RBI wasn't around, Ace was uh, was spinning. You know what I'm saying? So so we had a real uh, – we got a real um, – uh, 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 <laughs> somebody said Roots got shut down with a surprise. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, but yeah, so we really, so we really, um, you know, Opus means it still does, you know. And I remember when I was talking to you on the phone recently about when we, we disbanded. You right. know, that was tough for me. Emotionally, it was tough for me. I, I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I keep it a buck. It was tough for me. Because I love that group a lot, you know. What I mean, I love the guys. You know, Stan was playing guitar. You know, we had got to a place where our sound was just tight. Yeah, mm -hmm. Federico Gonzalez Pena was playing with Michelle. We met Federico in Italy on the gig with Steve, and he was playing with Michelle. Now Michelle and Deggio Cello, I'm talking about. Right. So now me and Michelle met because me and Michelle's birthday is the same day, right? So we'd be like, we birthday buddies, me and Michelle. You know what I mean? Freddie, um stop playing with us and it was like he would hear a sample and then I used to be like man it seemed like Freddie's ears got eyes you know because he could hear a sample and he could play down to the most minute detail man listen I'm Ezra got a lot of the footage there's one show we did at the Bayou I wanted to say it was the last night the Bayou was open Priest Storm Asheru uh, Freestyle Union Band and Opus uh and it was it was like a dream that night. It was crazy. I think that was the last night the bayou was open. And mm -hmm. um I mean, I'm gonna tell you what, I'm gonna tell you what, and I'm gonna let I'm gonna let it go about the opus thing. I'm gonna tell you what. That band was fearless, Joe. I mean, I was like it, there'd be times where Ezra used to have to yell at me to, to rap because I'd be so caught up in the music. <laughs> I forget what I'm up there for. He'd be like, wow. I'd be like, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I was like, I'm just, y'all crying so hard. I just want to get down on the floor and listen like everybody else. You know, we used to, you know, I used to pride. I, I felt, I, I felt like I, when we were on stage, mm -hmm. I knew that Coke had my back. He knew I had his back. Black knew we had, we all knew, everybody knew we had each other's back. And we used to practice so much that when we would get on stage, it would be like we were playing. But see, I learned that from Art of War about drilling. And I learned it from Kung Fu, too. Like, you practice and practice and practice. So by the time you do it, mm -hmm. yeah, it looked like you're having fun because it's not here anymore. It's in your body now. Right, right. And that's, you know, and that's, and that's kind of really, you know, you know, so it was, it was a, it was a special time, uh, and I'm really uh, and, and and the precursor to that was the Freestyle Union Band. Let me say that because that was that was Tony in the front, Rub, Priest, Kokai, and myself. Mm. And uh, Jay was on drum and Ezra was playing bass, and I was running samples. So that's how I really learned kind of like started to get comfortable with the idea of fusing like live samples with the band and stuff was through was, was through the freestyle union band right 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 which we used to crank. that used to crank a little bit nah that's bit. dope that's that's really dope the, um and all the places you've traveled to with the band um yeah that's really dope they got to steve coleman for putting putting all that together too Steve was a Steve is not was Steve is a is a, you know he's a genius. I'm fortunate in so far as that I'm able to kind of be around so many you know really genius minds you know um, 
you put yourself around a lot of genius people, mm-hmm. you win. You know, you you end up, you know, and, and he taught me he taught me a lot of stuff and, and, and really kind of a lot of the stuff he taught me. And I tell him this a lot. You know, he taught me kind of indirectly stuff. You know, I'd watch and see what he was doing. Right. And learn. You know, and, and learn. Right. He's a, yeah, he's he's definitely a lot of the mentors, a lot of the people who I see in my life as mentors. I've never like ever formally, except with, with Grandmaster Lou, I've never formally said like, you know, would you be my mentor? I just kind of, you'll know that I'm, you'll know you're my mentor because every time you turn around, I'm standing, I'm over there by you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Right, right. You're just you. You're just there listening, just taking it all in, soaking it up, soaking it up. Word. Yeah, that's that's really dope, man. Um, so okay, so after Opus Occupant, you took a you took like a a break, and uh, yeah, yeah, from me from music. Let's say a break from music in two thousand eight. Was it? 2008, yeah. 2008. Um, yeah, 2008. So in 2005 and 2006, we were going, We, I mean, me and Opus, we were going to, uh, we were going abroad with the State Department with this thing called American Music Abroad. Mm-hmm. And we were doing cultural exchanges, you know, and Tony kind of spearheaded that too. She was one of the first people to do that. And then, you know, a couple years later, we did that. And in these instances, um, we had to break the group down into four because they could only take four of us. Okay. So it was Kokai, myself, and uh, Ezra, and Jay, and I had my sampler and that sort of thing. Right? By this time, Black uh, was doing solo stuff. And, and so so we did that for a couple years. We had some really interesting, you know, travels those years, you know, um, we went to the Middle East one of those years, and then the next year we went to like China and Mongolia and wow. um, Russia. Yeah, the year before that we were in uh, Cairo and Jordan and Bahrain mm-hmm. and this kind of a thing. And um, how is the uh, how is like you know performing at these places? Was it like um, large crowds or was it like sort of an mm-hmm. intimate setting or? No, it depended, man. I mean, some places were huge. We did a spot in China that was huge. We did a spot in China that was in a mall, like a oh, mall wow. joint. Yeah. Um, um, you know, it would just really depend on the spot we were. You know, we did one gig in Cairo where we were right on the Nile. Like mm-hmm. the stage was like, we were on the stage and next to the stage, the Nile is just running, you know. Um, and then we were in some spots, you know, that were really, you know, um, I guess one of the most, one of the memories that sticks out in my head the most is when we were in the West Bank in Palestine, you know, when we were in Bethlehem, you know, mm-hmm. behind those checkpoints, Wow. you know, because, because before we went there, I had an idea of what a checkpoint, I, what I thought a checkpoint was. But when we got there and saw those 20 foot concrete walls around the whole city and we went and performed, and those people were so grateful. Uh, they came up and on the stage and put like the Palestinian kafir around our, over us and stuff like this. And then after the gig was over, we were like, well, come on over, you know, to this evening. We right over here in, in East Jerusalem doing the thing. And they was like, man, we can't come over there. Checkpoint, man. Right. And I right. was like, oh, you just show your ID. They was like, nah, Slim. Checkpoint, baby. We, we, I'm both. I'm gonna tell you, Joey, that thing messed me up, man. And and it right. and it and it and it, and it um, changed the way. So when I got back home, I'd hear people talking about you know Palestinians, you know, like they was like all terrorists and stuff. And I had some; they were the most beautiful people I ever met, man. And the in the in the headmaster of Bethlehem University, mm-hmm. she said, uh, she said we're not all terrorists. And I was like, I was like, we're not all gun toting thugs. I'm like, I'm a teacher. My man got two kids. She was like, we know that. We know. We know. Right, right. And, uh, and yeah. And then the other joke that had me crying <laughs> was when we were in when we were in Egypt, when we were in Cairo, and we did a we did a show, and uh, there was some Nubian folk drummers. 
that were playing, uh, like they opened up for us. Mm -hmm. And after the show was over, the translator came and one of the guys looked at me and he says, uh, when you coming back? And I said, uh, I told, you know, I said, I said to the translator, tell him, I'm like, I don't know when we're going to come back. And the guy looked at me and he smiled and he said, we'll be waiting. Man, I started crying, man. <laughs> <laughs> I started crying, man. You nah, know, they called you me cousin it. and stuff. Yeah, they was calling us cousin. I was like, That's you know, great. Man, Ka- Egypt, you know what I mean? The Nubians and them cats was like, what's up, cousin? I was like, man, you're going to have me out here crying. You ain't going to have right. me out here that's, crying. Right, like that's, that. that's amazing. <laughs> Must have had a lot, of, a lot of great responses from different countries. Yeah, um, but like the 2008, but like to, to, to what you were saying, mm-hmm. so, so in 2008, you know, we just, it, you know, we just, I guess we just disbanded, you know, the best way I can really describe it, you know, okay. we, we weren't really gigging a lot and, and you know, kind of people stopped moving far. I didn't stop making music, um, but I did sort of, there was a period of time when I wasn't really feeling like I had a lot of direction musically. Right. Fortunately for me, you know, I got three sort of muses that um, call me and it's music and it's art, you know, visual art and it's, mm-hmm. and it's martial art. Right. So what I did is I just kind of started focusing more on building a body of uh, work, sculptures, painting, and uh, showing some work here and there, you know, solo shows here and there. And then I, and then I started um, putting more energy into being on a competitive circuit in, you know, Kung Fu tournaments mm-hmm. as well. You know, it kind of really delved into my training with my second, with my second teacher. Because my first teacher in Chinatown, I was with him from 1994 until 2004. And he retired. And um, and then in 2004, up until now, I've been with Shaolin Yu, who is my, who, 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 you know, so so I really kind of was like intensifying my training and um, and just kind of writing songs and just not being real, uh, um, you know, like not really making no big declarations about this or that, you know. Right. Um, uh, and uh, and and really, now that I look at it, now I was actually laying the groundwork for Phalo, what would become Phalo Blue. I was writing songs when Opus was together that I knew were not Opus songs. I knew they were going to be. I had a concept back when I was in Opus. I had a concept called Phalo Blue. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know what it was going to even sound like. I had an idea, but I I couldn't play any instruments. You understand? Right. So I didn't right. really. I didn't really like, you know, I just kind of had some stuff. One of the one of the only people, and I love this guy to this day, Rashad, you know, um, he was one of the only people that uh, really kind of like, when it was real early, like 2005, uh, when I had some real rudimentary basic like stuff that I was like, this idea about Phalo Blue, he was, he was, he, you know, he was like, yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. That's what's up. And I was just like, you know, so I really appreciate him for that. That's my man, 50 grand. Plus, he, he don't know this. Maybe he do. But uh, one of his friends uh, who died when he was 19 got killed. Um, Rashad reminds me of him so much mm-hmm. that I got a certain kind of thing with Rashad. You know, he reminds me of my best friend, Tuji, who got killed. Um, and uh, uh, but uh, yeah, so so the, so I sort of was just kind of, you know, not floundering around, but I couldn't play no instruments, Joe. I couldn't play nothing. So, I mean, I was recording stuff, but Ezra would be like, yeah, that sounds cool, but what key is that in? And I was like, I don't know what key it's in, man. What key are you thinking in? He's like, there ain't in no key. How's your bass tune? I was like, I don't know. I got one string doing this. He's like, man, give me that junk. Yeah, tune your junk, man. You up here making songs that don't have this in a crazy key. Like, what key? You know what I mean? So, I literally, um, and then and then, but then he took me. He took me to. Uh, I don't know. This was this was this was before two thousand and eight. Actually, he took me to uh, at the. It was the Verizon Center. Ezra took me to. Uh, it was a Christmas 
concert, it was the first two nights in a row. It was the first night was Queens of the Stone Age, Nine Inch Nails, Stone Temple Pilots, Boxcar Racer. I can't, and maybe it was another group. Wow. And when I heard Queens of the Stone Age, they were so, so tight. Mm -hmm. I mean, their cue was just air tight. I was just like, I remember going home and just was like, I got to get this band. I got to get another band. And then the next night, Lenny Kravitz and uh, Nine Inch Nails. And I was mm. just like, yeah, I got to get it. I got to get it. <laughs> if I don't get another band together, I don't know what I'm going to do. Right. And so um, so, so then I just pursued, uh, you know, all right, well, all right, well, I guess I'm going to have to get, which, which, you know, and I'll mention this. Having a rock band wasn't like something that was a stretch for me, because when I was eleven, I was a I used to carry equipment for a, a black rock band. My next door neighbors had a a, a rock band in the okay. you know the southeast. So Eric Alexander, his name should go on there because he. I would sit on the wall and watch him rehearse, and then he'd give me a Jimi Hendrix album and say, "Go home, and listen to that, and when you finish, bring it back, and I give you another record." And I give him it back. He'd give me a Led Zeppelin record. I give him that. He'd give me a Janis Joplin record. He'd give me a Yes record. So he would give me these records, and he was tweaking my ears. So by the time I formed Phalo, it wasn't like Sub Z's all of a sudden going rock and roll. It wasn't. Right, right, right. It was like. It was like. I was doing rock. I was I was immersed in rock and roll music when I was 11. But at that time, at that era, it was like one minute you could listen to, you know, Jimi Hendrix and the next minute listen to Kiss, next minute listen to Rick James, next minute listen to Bootsy. It wasn't this big separation of genres, you know what I mean? So I was immersed. Plus my mother, you know, with just all this music. It's all on me, you know what I mean? So, right, so right, to do right. the rock thing. So is within and, and you... Plus, the whole time. Yeah, plus yeah, songwriting. Yeah. I mean, my mother, my mother used to always play all the songwriters, Neil Sadaka, Burt Bacharach, you know what I mean? Like the Carpenters, you know, Quincy Jones, you know, great songwriters and arrangers. Mm -hmm. So I would be hearing all this going into my Shirley Bassey, you know, so I'd be hearing this stuff, you know what I mean? And so, and then I'd be just sitting down all day long when I was a kid, sitting by the radio, listening to I just go through stations. I listen to WAVA one oh five. I listen to, you know, uh uh ninety one point like the punk station. I'd listen to, you know, so so by the time I was older, my 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 concept of um my concept comes uh of of song structure, you 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 know, it was kind of really just baked in, you know what I mean? So so I know, well, I don't know this, but I always kind of had a sense that on, I kind of had a sense that around 2008 or so when Opus broke up mm -hmm. that, and I, and I, and I got into the Thalo thing, the cast thought I stopped writing. Like the cast thought I like kind of, you know what I mean? Like right. I joined a commune or something. Like I was wearing macrame pants or something. Like I was <laughs> out here, you know, selling wicker baskets or something. I wasn't doing that. Right. I wasn't doing that. And not only that, give it a hot couple of more months, and Cat's going to really know what I've been doing. We'll see. There you go. But at any rate, but at any rate, um, um, it's, it was like, you know, so Thalo, uh, I found the, um, well, let me, let, before I go into that, what do you, do, is there something else? Did I, did I, did I answer your question? I'm yeah, sorry, you did. Man. You, yeah, you did. You did. Okay. But um, um all right, all right, but all right. let's talk about Thalo Blue. Um, you know how how you actually how you formed the band, mm. and um, mm. and we'll talk about your first video that you did with uh, Khalil. Khalil. Yeah. Khalil filmed your first yeah. video, music video. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 um. So, all right, so I, I, I knew I wanted to have a band called Thalo Blue, right? Okay. So uh, I went first immediately to the people who I knew could play instruments, right? I went to, um, I went to uh, uh, Omar, 
Um, and there was a bass player named Dava. And she, I, now it's funny because Dava never played in Thalo, but without Dava, Thalo wouldn't be what it is. Because what I would do is I'd put an ad in, I think I put an ad in Craigslist. And I went over to Dava's house and I had like two or three songs and she played bass and I had a guitar Mm -hmm. that I couldn't play. And uh, so she was just like, well, first of all, why are you sitting down? You know, are you going to do your set? Are you going to play your set sitting down? And I was like, no. And she was like, well, then you need to stand up. Cause you need to. And so she, she taught me how to sing and play. Okay. Right. She said, she, she showed me the steps to doing it. And she said, and then go home and practice that. And I was like, all right. Meanwhile, Ezra is in the background the whole time. Like, you know, and then, uh, so, but eventually what happened is, so, you know, me and DP, you know, from Pro MC, we, we go back. We got history. Mm-hmm. And I heard that he was playing guitar and stuff. So I called him over to my house one day and I was like, you know, you know, like, here's the ideas that I have. And he was like playing some stuff. And I said, yeah, I like that. But can like you just make it a little darker, like put a little bit of like rush on it. He was like, oh, rush. And he just like, I said, oh, that's my guitar player. Right. And so then same thing happened with the bass, you know, like Ezra was playing bass, but then Ezra gave me some crucial information. Ezra was like, he could hear what it was I was trying to do from what I was recording. Right. Right. And so he was like, really, he was like, I see, because I was playing bass when I was recording my own stuff, but I was putting a distortion on it. And he was like, see, what you really want is a baritone guitar or a bass six. And I was like, I don't understand nothing. What is what are, what are either one of those things? So I looked into it. And so when I found out that baritone was the kind of instrument where I could write the parts for the bass player and for the lead player. But when I'm performing, just play rhythm, it felt like the best of both worlds. So I could have a lead guitar player, a bass player, and I'm in the middle mm-hmm. playing rhythm with the baritone. So so it's a nice, even, a nice blend of dynamics, right? And when I found that out, we, uh, you know, our first time out was at Ross Hall Big up, big shout to my man, uh, Corey Stowers. We just did a podcast with him on my joint. Um, he was he was the guy up at, at Ross Hall. We had like an army up there. It was like Ezra. It was like Bill Vaughn. You know, Vaughn was playing. We had two bass players, two guitarists. It was like an army, right? <laughs> loud, 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 loud. Um, and basically what Ezra did is he rode along with us until he saw that we could have that sound without him and he was like I, he was like all right i'm leaving the group i was like what are you talking about no no i don't leave the group and he was like no i'm not adding or taking away y'all got it i'll be around but y'all got it right and so so that's so 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 then that's kind of like you know and so and so then you know so phalo kind of started getting some traction we would be you know i mean you're talking about four black cats in a rock band you know and here we go again oh that's like bad brains no it's not oh it's not it ain't like bad brains you know what I mean? We go to, you know, we go to clubs. Most of the audiences was, you know, most of the other bands we would play with were white bands. And they'd see us come in there and load up. They think we're going to rap. So then so then Bill and DP start doing this thing, doing sound check, where they would play rap tunes. They play so fresh and so clean on the sound check. And then, and then you know, cast be like, oh, yeah, these cats getting ready to rap. And then we go into our tunes, and they'd be like, oh, no, oh, oh. Right, we was coming at him real aggro. We was real aggro, Joe. We was coming at him because, because here's my feeling. I'm like, we stand on the shoulders of bad brains. We stand on the shoulders of the uh, sister Rosetta Thorpe. We stand on the shoulders of, you know, what I mean, a uh, 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 little Richard. You know, we stand on Chuck. Be- you know, what I mean, you name it. It's our cloth. You know, what I mean, respect the cloth. That's what we doing. So we used to come at it with that attitude, right? Like, all right, all right, y'all don't respect us. Watch this, right? And um. And, uh, and and the thing that used to be so crazy about it, yeah, uh, Anissa, she's in there. Anissa was in that night of uh, O'Shaughnessy's in Virginia when they was looking at us like we was eating something until we finished playing. <laughs> and they was like, they give you that look, like a, a combination of like, we hate you, 
but we won't be you kind of vibe, right? Right, right. Yeah, then we got a chance to open up for deaf, you know, and all that. So anyway, all that being said is um so I started feeling like, okay, well now I'm writing songs and I'm able to express things that really I couldn't express in a sixteen bar like some of the tunes that we were doing with Thalo was like, is if I took 16 bars of something that I would have written previously as a rhyme mm -hmm. and boiled it down to like, you know, I don't know, like four line, eight lines, you know, uh, and, um, and, uh, and it, it enabled me to be, able, but don't get it distorted during that whole time. I was still in the kitchen writing rhymes. I just was <laughs> like, I don't have no pressure. No right, pressure. Right. No pressure on me. You know, I always tell in a in a, 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 a HL and a NRB. I know when when I be telling them I'm on my uh, Lester Freeman. You know Lester Freeman on the wire. Yeah, yeah. Lester Freeman, how he just be, be off to the side working on his little furniture, making his minute. That was me for the last ten years. Right, right, right. You know, been making, that's how I've been with my bars. I've just been sitting around just making a little, you know, I ain't doing nothing. Hey, oh, whoa, oh, that's nice. Yeah, oh, okay. You know what I mean? But so your method, was, um, your method of writing um, for, for, for the band, um, did you see, like, the difference between, between, like, writing rhymes versus writing songs? like the structure of it or how is that for you? Like, did you, did you um, get into that? Did, did people help you or, or did you sort of do it in your own way? Sort of like, That's a good, I'm talking that's a about good writing. Question. Well, the, the technicality. Writing, yeah. The technicality of writing. Yeah. No, writing um, between, I mean, the difference between writing a rhyme and writing a song song. Yeah, I get it. I get it. So it's a good friend of mine, my man Sketch. Big shout to Jenny Hates Techno. He hit me to something that I didn't even recognize. So we got this tune, a Thalo tune called Rose and the Briar. Mm -hmm. Now I wrote the lyrics to the song, and then he hit me one day and said, you know, really, that's a rap lyric. you just singing it <laughs> like it's a song. And I was like, really? I was like, I didn't think of it that way. So, so, when, it came, so, so when it comes to writing Thalo tunes, the way that's usually kind of happened is I, you know, I come up with a melody or something like that. And then, um, and then the words kind of come like we got the tune amnesia, right? right. That was one of our first tunes, right? So amnesia, um, I literally was in church with my mother one day and not paying attention to church. Right. Cause I was sitting there and I was just like, amnesia. Damn, me, that don't sound like that could be. Yeah, so I'm in church, they doing tambourines and stuff, and I'm thinking that it hooked to amnesia. <laughs> and so then, um, again, you know, because I've been exposed to so much, so many different songwriters, right? Um, and, and, and different arranger, you know, composers and arrangers, you know, it didn't feel like it never felt like writing a song that was a Thalo song, like something that I had to break my head about. It just kind of, um, you know, like, here's the tune. Here's, you know what I'm saying? Like, here's, here's how that tune go, you know? Um, right. And, 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 the, and, the, and the lyrics, you know, would come. Um, I guess one of the things that kind of I seem to not lose from writing rhymes is that, you know, maybe it's a force of habit that a lot of most of my Thalo songs got some, got some kind of a rhyme scheme to them. Okay. You know, um, sometimes I'll be like having to, you know, tell myself like, T, you know, you don't have to make it, don't, don't have to rhyme. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, that's kind of a carryover, you know, I think in terms of rhyme, you know, I mean, I think that way, you know, um, and, uh, and, and stuff. But, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's really, it's really been, Thalo Blue has definitely been a healing experience for me and a growth experience. And it's been really good because I've been able to see my friends from, you know, hip hop circles. We got this whole other bond. I'm talking about specifically like DP, mm -hmm. Bill, you know, um, now and, and big shout to my man, Joe Hall, because Joe, uh, he's solid, rock solid drummer, man. And uh, he was with us, you know, um, he was with us the whole time. He heard his, he, he 
tore his Achilles a couple of years ago. Um, but I'm glad that he kind of got back, you know, got back off of that. You know, he healed from that. But um, particularly DP and, 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 and Bill, man, like having known these guys from doing hip hop records together and to, to for them to be like, you know what I'm saying? Like my soldiers, you know, my, 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 my fellow soldiers in, in Thalo, you know, it's really like, man, you know, I'm, I'm really blessed, man. And, 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 you know, the fact that, you know, they know that I'm the worst player in the room. They know that, you know, and I know it. Right. So it's like, it's like, but, but they, but I know my ear. Right. I, I don't really doubt my ear that much. So my whole thing is I bring the music to the group. We work it out. I'm not super attached to it. I might have some specific things depending on what the tune is. I may have some specifics, but generally speaking, you know, I trust, I trust DP that he going to get down, how he going to get the, and Bill going to lock and load and get down, how he get down. And my, and my job is to carry the ball, carry, you know, carry my, carry the ball like I'm supposed to carry it. Make sure if I'm playing rhythm, we'll make sure my rhythm is rhythmic. You right, know what I'm right. saying? I'm singing, you know, I'm saying if I'm and, and make sure that I'm singing, you know, how it's supposed to be, you know, that's so that I ain't you know, sounding um, crazy out there, you know. So you're going to you're going to you're going to yeah. continue with the band, right? Going to make hmm. more music in the future. Yeah. yeah, I'm not, you know, I mean, like, um, um, you know, of course, COVID, uh, COVID had, uh, you know, Put a put a slowdown on things, but um, right. but we've been able to still you know make contact. We got like our push up club, you know what I mean, where we make sure we everybody's staying healthy, and uh, you know and working on our scales and making you know and I'm 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 working on song ideas for Thalo, but um, I'm working on you know song ideas for Thalo, and as well as uh, as well as um, you know I got some other I got some other hip hop projects. That's uh, I'm really excited about. Wow. Really excited about. So, what have you been doing? Um, okay, so the pandemic happened, and it kind of put a stop on things, but um, it sort of made you do things you couldn't, you didn't think you had time for. So, what yeah. were you doing, or what what kept you busy during during the pandemic? Well, so um, prior to the pandemic, you know, my day job was working down at Smithsonian at the Hershon Museum, uh, hanging art. Okay. Um, and before that, I was a curator over in Anacostia at the Anacostia Art Center in an on-floor gallery. And fortunately, um, the owner of the, uh, you know, the gallery in Anacostia, right when the pandemic hit and stuff started closing and the Smithsonian closed, he called me and was like, why don't you come on back? You know, there's some things you could do. So, so, so since then, what I've been doing is, um, you know, I curate a music event called the hut and, um, and really what it is is just a showcase for local musicians, you know, that they don't have to worry about if the club is going, you know, how many tickets they sell or how many drinkers or whatever, you know, just people like, you know, who, who I want to see, you know, come out and support and do their thing. Right. And so, um, so during this pandemic time, I had to learn some skills. I had to learn how to live stream. I had to learn how to use OBS broadcasting joint, you know, um, and, um, and, uh, and so that's what I've been doing. Like, you know, during the day I've been, uh, I've been, um, you know, like just, uh, doing, podcasts, doing, you know, uh, we got a little bit of a budget through a grant so I can call like, you know, musicians and be like, look, I can give you two. If anybody out there, you know, one that got a got a group that crank, you know, I can give you forty five mm -hmm. minutes set, two fifty. Yeah, um, yeah, there you go. You know what I'm saying? You know so, who to hit so up, like, Troy. Uh, you know, Troy, you know who to hit up. You know <laughs> yeah. I mean, because because I mean, you know, so and I guess in some sense just trying to, you know, because of how I'm positioned right now, um, trying to, you know, be of some little bit of my little part, do my little part in that regard, mm -hmm. you know. because um, I know it's tough out here for, for all, you know, particularly for Right, right. Stuff and, um, and uh aside from that you know like just uh learning my uh you know tightening up my little kung fu techniques you know i'm, I'm always practicing my little kung fu's and uh 
and, and, and painting, you know, working on my art, you know, um, my, I'm working smaller now, so I'm doing like silk screen and different stuff like that. So I've been quite creative. Yeah. Um, I've been quite creative, if I must say so myself. Um, but again, the what I really want to emphasize is that since this pandemic, um, I've found a new love for uh, putting these bars together. And I found that there's some really, you know, big shout to HL, big shout to Team Demolition, big shout to Nomadic and uh, and Black Ink. I got y'all. I got y'all. <laughs> I mean, so there's something in the works, everybody. Like, you know, so Z got his... Yeah. Got his hip hop bug back. I had to test the, I had to check the temperature for a second though. I had to check the temperature for a second because I didn't want to come out here like, you know, oh here come this dude, like he'd been in jail twenty years. He coming back talking about something. <laughs> you know what I mean? I ain't wanna be that dude. But I'll check the temperature out and, 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 and people who whose ear I trust, they were like, you know, nah man, you Right, you, right. You, nah you you okay. From the stuff so, that you so, uh, you had me here. It's all quality stuff. Of course, it's stuff you would expect to hear from Sub Z. So it's oh, man, dope. That's, that's a very brother. dope. That's a lot. Uh, very that's, dope, that's, brother. That's um, mighty kind of you, brother. That's mighty kind <laughs> of you. <laughs> nah, because if it was whack, you know, I'd be like, well, um, maybe you need to go back to the to the boys. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, listen, man. I mean, no, like, but no, nah, it's really I'm dope. Here. It's really good. Good to hear. Good to hear you um, rhyme again, especially mm. at, during this time and stuff like that. Because, like, you know, Thalo Blue, the Thalo Blue stuff is very dope. You know, I saw mm. I saw the videos and, and you know, I just kept in, kept in touch from where I was at, either in the mm -hmm. Philippines or what, wherever I was at at that time. It's <clears> like, wow. Like he's really doing it, man. Yeah. So it's really yeah. dope that you've expanded your creativity to other levels. You know what I'm saying? So it's not, you know, just one thing. But it's yeah. something that you yeah. loved for a long time that that built this that built this band together and you know and you had like and it's crazy to think because you've You've had experience with bands, so with Opus Occupant as well, you know? Yes. So it couldn't be that hard for you to, like, you know, to to form to form Thalo Blue, like, as a band, because you already have that experience in a way of, like, well, yeah, you know, dealing yeah, with yeah. bands. I grew up, I grew up around, I grew up in a time where live bands were a thing, and and I've spent most of my life around live musicians. Mm -hmm. So so it's really kind of um, you know, natural for me to 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 have a to be in that kind of a setting. You know, it's just it just it's just natural for me to be in that kind of a setting. And I just uh um the thing that I guess I've learned over the years and particularly now, man. It's tricky with having a band um, because this, the game is different, you know. Oh yeah. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, so, so, like, we were, we were, you know, pre-pandemic, and at least, and in, in particularly, like, around the years of uh, 2016, 2017, uh, maybe even 2018, um, you know. We, we we were find you, you could find yourself in a sort of a like the like almost like the chitlin circuit of like rock band mm. cities to hit. And if you remember like how the nineties were with not just hip hop but even with like with rock and roll music, um, you know, the record label, you know, that whole structure, man, you know, like, you know, like getting the record deals and all of this. Um and so much music out here now. Right. Um, so then, so then the question is like, well, what, what drives you to keep on wanting to perform? And in my case, it just happens to be like I just love playing music. You know, what I mean, I love performing. I love playing music. Um, and if um, if 
if it if if it was about the money, I'd have been quit. You know, like yeah. um, I got song. I'm a songwriter. You know what I mean? Like that's part of what I do. Right. You know, um, and so and so I'm gonna write. I'm gonna, you know, I haven't had any inkling to stop writing. Nah, so, that's great. You know, that's 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 amazing, man. So, um, what advice would you give to the um, next generation of artists that want to do what you do? Ooh, well, um, I would huh, advice. Well, I would. My suggestion would be. I guess a couple things. One is uh, so I so 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 I read the Tao Te Ching. That's my one of my favorite books. The Tao. For those who don't know, I I, I had a couple books there with me in case I needed to okay. use a reference. So the Tao Te Ching, we can't even see it here. But the Tao. People say Tao, but it's Tao. Um, the Tao Te Ching is a very good. It's, it's short. The Tao is not a long book, but it talks just kind of about the way you know your path, right? And if you know what your path is, or if you, you you know if you have some reasonable clarity about your path, then what you do will support it. So in other words, what I'm saying is, is that if I say you know like that thing I told you about, like the guy wanted me to change the title of the song, and he would be like you know, and I and I hold you down, I, I pay you for it if you just you know kind of like basically compromise what it was that you were wanting to do. Right, right. And, you know, and although I wasn't conscious of it in that, in the, at that moment of, like, it was on my path or not, I guess I kind of was. So I was, like, you know, thinking, like, well, no, that's not, that's not the path I'm on. So, no, it's not about the money. It's about the path. And, no, I'm not, on, you know. And, and, um, and so I would say, you know, I, I'd say it'd be important for an artist to make sure – that the decisions that you make are decisions that you be comfortable with, that you can that you can go to sleep with. Uh, and then the other thing is patience. Patience. There you go. Be patient. Be patient. Be patient. Patience. Patience is important. Man. Patience. Is mm -hmm. important. I think. I think. I think. Patience no, that's is that that that's great advice because not a lot of ha uh, people have have uh patience it's always like oh my gosh i gotta get to the next thing i gotta do this and and that and just like you know do it at a certain time before i'm this age or you know it's it's crazy where like and patience the other thing is just you, like you know that's, yeah. can put yeah. something in the i mean in a totally different perspective you know what i mean yeah and then to be teachable to be teachable is the other thing you know try to try to try to stay green, you know, try to, try to stay green, try to stay teachable. There you never you know who, you never know who's going to give you your lesson. It mm -hmm. might be somebody younger than you. It might be a baby. My kid was four years old would tell me, my kid is 10 right. now. But when he was like five and if I was driving and I was getting a little bit too, whatever, whatever, and he'd say something like, daddy, be careful. You know, I used to hear that and I should be like, you know what? You're right. I'm going to be careful. I'm a, I'm a, cause they closer the little kids, little babies and kids and stuff. You know, I, I think that they're closer to, to the essence anyway. So I try to listen to little kids. Right. You know, I ain't going to do nothing. But you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, you know. Yeah. Nah, that's, teach you. Yeah. that's dope advice, man. That's, that's really dope. Um, so where can people find you on social media mm -hmm. and purchase and listen to your music? Um, so, um, the only thing we have right now for purchase is Thalo stuff, and that's on Bandcamp. Um, now it's spelled T H A Y L O B L E U, like the French blue, Thalo blue. Um, and we're on Instagram, Thalo blue. Um, and then I have art, my art page. Mm -hmm. Well, Instagram is T Nicholson Art. My website is Terrence Nicholson Art, but my name has one R, T-E-R-E-N-C-E. -E -E. Terrence Nicholson Art, and, you, and you'll see my sculpt, 
and things, video uh, uh, things, some stuff I had from an artist residency, that kind of a thing. And then um, my sub Z lyrics Instagram, sub dot Z lyrics. Um, stay tuned on that. A lot of times I put like little clips from Kung Fu training and stuff there because Kung Fu training and rhyming and, and skills and stuff like that to me are so inner 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 you know what I'm saying like interchangeable in terms of um the lessons I get from them both um that's the reason why I put that up there now Jen Slake says pin it and I don't know how to pin it um so um now that's where I'm starting to age myself because I don't know how you're gonna pin it hey, hey Jen Slake if I could if I could pin it I'd put you <laughs> put it on the refrigerator <laughs> <laughs> on the refrigerator and pin it. I don't know how to pin it. Pin it. I want to. Don't know how. Well, just say the name again. So it'd be under your Instagram is sub Z. Oh, Instagram. Sub, yeah, sub dot Z lyrics. Yeah, sub dot Z lyrics. And then um, T Nicholson art. T Nicholson art is my art thing. And even right. if you go to T Nicholson Art Instagram, in the bio is the link to my website. And then Phalo Blue. Yeah. There you go. Yo, Man. Sub Z, thank you for this journey, man. This is uh this has been a dope interview. Um happy that like very happy we caught up. And um, you know, just all the all the things that you mentioned, um, you know, from the band. From even um, you know Opus Akiban, it's just an amazing ride, man. And of course, like you know, you've traveled, you've seen the world through music, you know, through doing something yeah. you love, and it's very, very important. And of course, Freestyle Union, <laughs> you can't forget Freestyle yeah. Union. Yeah. Something oh, no. that oh, no. that oh, needs no. to be told, you know, because you know it happened, like. Yeah. No one can yeah. say like I mean it's that's that's a, that's like you know that's like the um springboard for so many of us doing what we do now. And 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 we can't uh I can't emphasize that enough. You know, who knew at the time? See, that's the reason why people when people talk about like we need to create a scene. No, we don't. When right. when, when listen, when the um DC hardcore punk scene was the scene. Nobody, I guarantee you, was there like we need to make this punk scene because they was too busy being it. Mm -hmm. When Freestyle Union, Copper House, and all that went on, none of us was running around talking about like the scene. We were too busy living right. it, being it. You know what I mean? And we look back on it now and see how significant it was and, and how everybody's, uh, 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 you know. I mean, and peace to Joy. I think about her a lot. When I see amphibian stuff, Joy crosses my mind a lot. And I, and I, and I just, you know, um, we're carrying, we, you know, we, 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 we're, we are dots on the continuum of the timeline of history. And what you're doing is important in, 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 the, you know, in that regard. You know what I'm saying? That to remind people, man, because otherwise, otherwise, you know, that story will get wiped right out. They'll be like, ain't nothing happened on U Street in the 90s. Ain't nothing happened. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, you've, you've yeah. heard it here. You've heard it here in many of time, many, many of other French convos about uh, the DC scene. I mean, it was there. It was there. And, and you know, I, in some way, it's still there. I hear you, Slim Cat. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So, I yeah. mean, it's good to, like, you know, reflect back and make sure, like, you know, other people from outside of D.C. or, like, you know, everywhere else around the world knows why, you know, yeah. D.C. got, like, ill MCs. Why D.C. got real ill MCs. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, real dope artists, poets, Singers like a lot. Just, hey, just man. a lot, man. I'm gonna tell you something. Right now, some of my I'm talking about I'm talking about the cast that keep me with my pen on the page right now. Like is like 
you know, let the, you know, Tim, you know, let the you know, dirty yes. church and why you just them two by themselves keep my pen on the paper because them cats is like yikes. And then Boy, I was a judge yeah. in the whammies. I was a judge in the whammies. Uh, and as I was going through like, you know, the hip hop stuff, you know, categories, I was like, Oh, we're gonna be just fine, Joe. We're gonna be just fine. That's dope. rest assured. We're gonna. I'm just a listen. I'm just a old. I'm just an older cat that still ain't really finished, you know. But make no mistake about it. And prowess the testament. Listen, we're gonna be just fine. Look, I just did a thing <laughs> with, with Art now. We're gonna be. We're gonna be just fine with these cats. These these. You know. Oh, we're gonna be just fine. I ain't. You know. I'm just. I'm just sitting back, taking it all in, sitting on the couch, <laughs> you know, drinking a cup of coffee. Like, all right, y'all, all right, I got, let me come down off the porch and say a little something, and get back on this porch. <laughs> yeah, I, I must say, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what's been coming out. Like, you know, the artists that are still doing doing things, and you know, yes, of course, why you, Shamir. of course, Tim Shamir, yeah. yes. Um, very talented, Listen, you know. Man, forget about it. Forget about it. They got to keep, like, you know, it's just like the hunger is still there, which which I appreciate. It never slacked off. I mean, like, I think about this all the time. Just like, wow. Like, you know, if I I'm want sure you're, I'm sure you're, every time I I'm go sure back to D.C., it's just like, you know, I'm Even though it's I'm changed show you the a lot, but still. Here's the future right here. Here's the there future right here. The future is right there. That's G-Wiz right there. That's the future right there. That's G-Wiz. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful, brother. <laughs> that is beautiful. All right. So this is uh, Fresh Convo Season 2. I have a few announcements. One is uh, uh, the Crush album by the Amphibians is coming out April 30th on, on Bandcamp. Mm -hmm. Bandcamp release. Bandcamp release. So um, go to our Bandcamp um, April 30th. Uh, and it's called Crush. Crush meaning falling in love. And, you know, yeah, so you get the point. Crush. Um, also, um, we're uh, posting up a meeting, meaning behind the rhyme interview with, uh, with Jamal. Um, hosted by Coyote. So that's coming up on our YouTube, Amphibians YouTube. Subscribe. Go on there. That's <clears> gonna um it's gonna air probably after after this interview. Um also check out the first single, Sense of Mia by Jamal. It's a dope song. It came out four twenty, so you don't know why it's called Sense of Mia and, and it's the first song on four twenty. <laughs> Word and also um, next week. Well, the, the following weeks, fresh convos is gonna. Um, I'm gonna air um, the the interviews I did on Zoom. So May fifth, we're gonna have Queen Heroin from the Juggernauts. So that'll wow. be the interview that's posted up next week on Wednesday, seven o'clock. But just go to Amphibians YouTube and you'll. You'll, you'll definitely see the interviews. Um, yo, um, Sub Z, thank you very much. Like I said, this was very dope. Um, I'm like, you know, like, like very happy of this interview, everything that you said. And like, you know, I know a lot of people enjoyed this, this joint here. So, um, yeah, Keep man. Doing Any last doing, words? Bro, bro. I just, I just want to, um, you know, I just want to uh, thank everybody. I've been checking out, like, I get little messages and stuff from cats, and I just want y'all to know, like, when y'all give me like positive energy, like I've been getting lately, it means a lot. It means a lot, and I'm just, I just don't take that for granted. You know what I'm saying? I'm really grateful. You know what I'm saying for, uh, for, for all you guys, you know, energy that you give me, and just know that, uh, that uh, I take that energy, you know, and right back at you. Three times over. <laughs> That's dope, man. All right. So next week is Queen Heroin on um, 
Amphibian's YouTube and uh, make sure you check this. Um, this interview will be posted up on our um, on our IG right after this, actually. So, oh, all right, that's cool. Uh, okay. So, uh, peace and love, everybody. Peace and love. Peace.